Hi, my name is Craig Richardson and welcome to Mind to Heart. In this show, we take a journey from our logical, critical mind to the powerful heart center where real transformation occurs. My guests help us understand our journeys by telling us about their paths and lessons they've learned along the way. In 1848, two sisters from Hydesville, New York, Catherine and Margarita, lived in a house that many believe was haunted. They began hearing rapping noises at night and the brave girls decided to rap back. Shortly thereafter, a sister system of communications developed between the spirits and the girls, and the story received international press coverage. Thus, modern spiritualism was born. Seances, mediums, telepathy, and all types of paranormal activities swept the United States and the, and the UK in the latter half of the 19th century. High society people began getting together to try to receive messages and speak with departed loved ones at private homes. This was especially poignant during the American Civil War that took so many so young. Even President Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln held seances in the White House. Of course, not everyone in a predominantly Christian culture accepted this new phenomenon, and many skeptics emerged that attempted to discredit the mediums and those who practiced and dabbled in the art. Other Others simply dismissed it as the work of the devil. However, some in the scientific community took a more rational approach and began studying things like spiritual entities, life after death, psychokinesis, ESP, table tipping, and mediumship. And the experiments began shortly after the Fox sisters emerged on the scene, and thus the field of parapsychology was born. The Society for Psychical Research was founded in London in 1882 with the goal of organizing scientists and scholars to investigate paranormal phenomena. A similar organization began in the United States. My guest today, Lloyd Auerbach, has dedicated much of his life to the study of parapsychology. He received a master's in the field and is affiliated with the Rhine Research Center, a leading parapsychology institute. I met Lloyd during my master's at Edgar Cayce's Atlantic University. He teaches intro to parapsychology, and when I first enrolled in the course, honestly, I thought we were going to learn how to communicate telepathically, bend spoons for a semester, oh, and maybe do a little ghost hunting while we were at it. And while we did see some of that, and Lloyd understands a bunch of this, having been a magician, is a magician, and a consultant to television shows, documentaries, and Hollywood feature films on the paranormal, yet when it comes to the field of parapsychology, it's a very serious scientific discipline. His course was intensive, fact-based, and followed protocols more strictly than any other scientific discipline. And it has to since, quote, mainstream science has largely ignored this field and or ridiculed it from the beginning. So now I'd like to bring in today's guest, Lloyd Auerbach, to help us understand the field of parapsychology, the paranormal in general, and how it can help with our own journeys as we delve into the spiritual nature of our universe. Lloyd, welcome to Mind to Heart. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Greg. Good to be here. It's good to see you again. Uh, I, I, you know, even when I took the took your course, there was a lot of misinformation that I had and people have, and, and I know you've worked with Hollywood. A lot of this comes from Hollywood and the Ghostbusters. So I, I'd like to begin sort of at the beginning, if you could help us, you know, define, let's start with paranormal. What, 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 how would you define paranormal? What do you think, it, you know, what, how do you see it as, as somebody who's an expert in the field and, and what is it exactly does it include? Well, the word paranormal just means on the side of normal. And, you know, the, the way the TV shows have actually changed the meaning of that term, which originally was applied to any psychic experience back in the 1800s. Uh, now it seems to only relate to ghostly stuff. And that's actually not the case. And of course, people in the UFO community might use that term for UFO experiences or, or anything else. So we, we tend not to, within the field, not to use the word paranormal. We tend to use the word psychic or psi. Psi being the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet that relates to all psychic phenomena. As opposed to psych ops, right? Which is something completely different, I'm it's, sure. That's PSY. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in, in the field of parapsychology, because again, you know, as I said in the intro, I didn't really even understand that that field existed. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure how many mainstream people do, but can, can you give us a little background? Because I, I talked a little bit about the founding and, and the relationship yeah. between the US and the UK, but 
Can you talk a little about the Ryan Institute and some of the experiments they were doing? Because I was very impressed at the level of detail that they were going in, like with the cards and everything. Can you talk about some of the experiments that they were get, got off into? Well, well, those are some of the early experiments. First, I should, should mention that probably if you go back or anybody uh, above maybe 60 years old will know the word parapsychology and connected to Duke University because the original parapsychology lab outside of the confines or the um, activities of the Society for Psychical Research and the American Society was started at Duke University in the early 1930s. And that was an actual university laboratory, parapsychology laboratory, started by William McDougall, J.B. Ryan, and Louisa Ryan, and a number of other folks. And they, they were the ones who did the initial ESP card experiments. They did experiments with dice rolling to see whether or not people could influence dice. Uh, the ESP cards themselves didn't exist before Carl Zener, one of the psychologists on faculty, actually came up with that pack with that, at the request of J.B. Ryan. So the initial experiments were done, you know, certainly they didn't have computers at that time, which is what we're mainly using today, um, but they did testing with cards, testing with dice and other things under more and more controls as they learned how they had to exclude how our senses pick things up. So that's one of the things we've learned is, is how much our senses can actually pick up. Since that I, time, yeah, I was gonna say, we, we've no, had a lot no, of right. other methodologies. I'm not sure which, which, which direction you want me to go for that as well. Well, I, I think the important thing again for the, our, our audience, and I think we are getting it, it, it. So I think we've, and you talked about one in the thirties or forties. I, I, it seems to me that there was a much more, and even in the 1800s, you know, you had the president of the United States having seances. It seemed that there was a lot more acceptability of these psychic experiences, as you put it. And at the same time, Ryan comes out, we also seem to have gotten into more of a, you know, centralized modern scientific structure. And so we kind of went into a fog, do we not? And, so, and now we sort of seem to be reinventing or rediscovering things that we had learned a while ago. Well, you know, I have to say that parapsychology does uh, cover things like life after death, survival of bodily death. The problem is you can't do those in the laboratory. I mean, you can't bring a ghost into the laboratory. We haven't found anybody who's willing to, to you know, a deceased person who's willing to actually show up. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> so um, you, you can't put the kinds of controls in field work that you'd like to do in a laboratory controlled situation. But for extrasensory perception and mind over matter, what we call psychokinesis, you can bring people in uh, and test them and put them through the ringer more or less to see not only whether or not people can do these things, but also what kind of person can do these things. What's the personality variables? What other things can we do? What conditions of altered states can we play with to actually increase or, or see how people are affected in that way? So from the field, you know, most of the work was being done in the seance room and going out in the field, although there was definitely some laboratory work going on in the late 1800s and early 1900s before Rhine. You know, Ryan is kind of considered the uh, father of modern parapsychology, experimental parapsychology for that reason. So it, it's... Well, and, and then you've got, you've got Duke University, which is certainly a blue chip yeah, uh, yeah. And, name and to he had associated such, with. He had, he had such a, the American College of Mathematicians in the 1950s looked at his data for ESP and declared that there was enough evidence that ESP existed from a statistical perspective. Now that didn't go over well with a lot of scientists, but I have to say that really the negative attitudes didn't start to the degree that they, we see them today until the, the mid 1970s with the skeptics organizations founding. And, and, and what do you see as the genesis of the pushback? Um, I mean, is it just people were, didn't like to be taken out of their comfort zone or, what, or was there some conspiratorial I, I, effort? No, I, I think it was a reaction to, um, a change in attitudes towards consciousness and what happened in the 60s with expansion of consciousness uh, in the 1970s. We, I mean, basically from the late 60s to the early 70s, there was an explosion in publishing of books of all sorts of occult nature and supernatural nature, not parapsychology per se, although those were actually also exploding. There are tons of paperbacks, mass market paperbacks, to the point where you couldn't go to any airport um, you know, gift shop and not see a turnstile that had all sorts of books <laughs> on the new age and the paranormal and the occult and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so there was a pushback there uh, from folks. There was also a, a heavy focus in the 
media on certain psychics and especially Uri Geller, which generated a controversy because of the amazing Randy who decided to go after him uh, as a phony, which Geller is an, a really interesting case of someone who can do both and do magic, kind of like sleight of hand type magic and actually seem to have real ability mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but, but that just generated a lot of animosity, I, I guess you could say, between the two sides. And it seemed that people started coming out of the woodwork because of what Randy did and what other scientists who were affiliated with Randy or were looking to support what he did, they actually decided to start an organization that would supposedly skeptically look at these experiences, but turned out to be biased in terms of disbelief for that. Yeah, and they started and with they a really made a big deal about it. it. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, well, I, one of my mentors a man, was a man named Marcello Truzzi, who was a sociologist from the University of Eastern Michigan. And he was a true skeptic. Um, he also read research in parapsychology. None of the others did, with the exception of one individual. And he was a founder of this organization, but he left after he found out very clearly that they had a very different agenda than he did. They didn't want to know what was really going on. They wanted to show that there was nothing going on. Yeah, and I think we've seen that, Lloyd, really since the 70s in a lot of different areas of, of, yeah. of quote, mainstream science. There, you know, what started out, I mean, and you see that beautifully, you know, with the story of the Fox sisters, and then within literally three or four years, you have people saying, you know, other than the, the skeptics and the people who were, were offended by, hey, what's going on here? And there was, that was what science was at that time. And I think, you know, since the seventies, I think there's really has been this sort of monolithic, here's the truth, here's not, and how don't, don't you dare question that. It's, it's scientific dogma, but, you know, I have to say that with the spiritualist world, um, going back to the late, starting at least in the, in the last quarter of the 1800s and probably a little before that, there were phonies. I mean, there mm -hmm. were people who started popping up and taking advantage of people because they could, because they could fake this stuff. Uh, the spirit photographs are a good example of that from the late 1800s. There were a number of photographers who made their living making phony spirit <laughs> photographs. So, uh, you know, whenever there is an opportunity for somebody to scam other people, that's gonna show up in any field. It doesn't, not just this world, but in others. Yeah, and that's a good point. I mean, I think it was your talk. I thought of the guy with the with the wagon wheel selling the the snake oil. So, you know, that was all part of that same time period yeah, as well. Yeah. And so I, yeah, and and I think that that to me when I took the course, what really struck me and I talked about already was the scientific approach you took, and that you know you were as your field it was as if not more oriented towards weeding out the fakes, right? You were like, because it was it was giving you a black eye almost, not you personally, but you know what I mean? And, right. and you went to great lengths to try to, to flush these people out. In fact, what sent the Rhines and William McDougall into the laboratory specifically was a medium uh, situation with a medium named Marjorie in the 1920s, who was kind of, uh, Houdini was incredibly opposed to. She was very controversial on a number of levels. And uh, Ryan, the Rhines went to, and McDougall went to one of her seances. And the next thing you know is they're saying, oh, forget this, we're gonna go to the laboratory. <laughs> so they did not have a good experience with that medium. Uh, and then she was a physical medium. That's very different than the mediums we see for the most part on TV today. Yeah, physical mediums that can actually have, you know, trumpets fly around and app ports, which Ectoplasm are what, things from the other side. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there, there is, and so it, it seems to me, you know, there was definitely a lot of fun to it, but there are also people, and they also, if you, when you study these individuals, like you mentioned, they were larger than life. I mean, they were entertainers first and foremost. Um, and they, and like you said, they had the ability to sort of manipulate people when, when, when necessary. Uh, we're going to, we're going to take our first break, Lloyd, but when I want to get, when we get back, I'd like to talk about specifically a program that, that the government was involved with, which was the Stargate. Uh, program and some of that, uh, you know, I, mean, I actually wrote a paper, if you may recall, on that four-year course, and I was very fascinated with that whole thing, having living two and a half miles from the CIA. Um, so when we get back, we'll, we'll talk about that with my guest, Lloyd Auerbach. Hi, welcome back to Mind to Heart with your host, Craig Richardson, and my guest, Lloyd Auerbach. Lloyd, before the break, you were giving us a great background on, on parapsychology, and I, and I wanted to get into a specific program, uh, and you can talk a little bit about the background, but as soon as the U.S. government realized that there might be a way to actually use 
remote viewing or being able to remotely see something where you're not, uh, in, in particularly in the in the Cold War, uh, they got involved with this, did they not? Did they not get involved with parapsychology or paranormal? Yeah. What, what the well, actual definition? Is? There, there had been prob some some people in the government who had various parts of the government who had been interested in this subject before that. Uh, before 1972, but it was really the the information that was coming out of Russia that the Soviets were actually doing and succeeding at, at psychic espionage that caused our government to panic a little bit and start the program that eventually became known as Stargate. It actually had multiple names uh, from the very beginning, but it started with a government contractor, Stanford Research Institute or SRA International these days, moved over eventually to another government contractor and another one. So it's bounced around as government programs often do. Uh, it was started under the auspices of the CIA, but left the CIA after a short time and then bounced around again, but under the auspices of different government agencies, including the Defense Department and DARPA and a few others and came back eventually for the last two years of its existence under the CIA again. Uh, but it was a very successful program, um, it, depending on how you measure success. Uh, for that, we we um, I wrote you know co-authored a book with the direct the program director Edwin May, who was the program director from 1985 to 1995 when it, sh it shut down. Uh, also, one of our co-authors is Joe McMonagall, who was yeah. the number one viewer for the program. But our book's called ESP Wars East and West, but it's also the only book that actually covers the Russian side of the story too. We have contributions from the Russians who were involved. Oh, that's that yeah, that's a great that's a great way to do that. And can you explain a little bit exactly? I mean, I know you know some people may or may not be familiar with a remote viewing. What what exactly sure. were they doing? So remote viewing should really be called remote perception because when we talk about extrasensory perception, we're talking about picking up information, and it can come to some people visually. It can come to people. Uh, they can feel it. They can sometimes smell it or hear it. It comes through in a sensory analog, you might say. Uh, it became known as remote viewing because you know, human beings have such a, an emphasis on sight. That seems to be our main emphasis. So remote viewing, uh, the program started by Russell Targ and Hal Putoff, uh, working with Ingo Swan, who was a well-known psychic who could do out-of-body work and, and his own version of what became remote viewing. And they actually took hundreds of potential candidates from the army from the armed services, ran them through a full day of testing and all sorts of things, ended up with 60 and eventually got down to six wow. to start the program. Pretty exclusive. Uh, yeah, so that's the starting point. They, they expanded over time, they had other people eventually. But remote viewing is the idea that I can sit down and basically clear my mind, be given a target and, to, and ask what is at that location or what is happening at that location, or perhaps what is going to happen at that location in a few hours, in a few days, and provide information, uh, which is not gonna be, I think, what we see in movies where it's a full, perfect picture, but right. it, think of it as getting a bunch of pick part pieces of the puzzle that is that image, that is that location for that. Uh, and so they were tasked with any number of different things, such as, you know, someone was kidnapped, where is that person? We're, we They actually work with law enforcement a number of times. Angela Ford, one of the viewers, worked with law enforcement. The FBI, you know, they had a, a manhunt. Where is this guy? And she actually found this guy that they oh, were wow. looking for. Um, Joe McMonagall was tasked with, at one point, with what's in this huge where this huge building. The Soviets are building something. Uh, we have a satellite photo of the image of the building from above. And he was able to, to actually give them information of what they are actually building by looking into the future when they were going to roll out the first of the Typhoon class submarines. So, which oh, wow. was completely unknown to us at that time. So it's, it's been fair, a fairly, it was a fairly successful program. Uh, Ed May likes to cite the statistic of uh, 19 federal agencies came to the program with tasks for viewings. 17 came back multiple times. Wow. So when you, you know, people on the other side and the skeptic side of the set will say that it was not successful. Even the CIA, I mean, CIA at the end, there was a political thing going on at the very end, which we can get into if you want, but um, that, that really killed the program. And it was purely political more than anything. It had nothing to do with success of the program. But Ed, Ed's comment is, you know, if you go to a restaurant um, 19 times, or you have 19 people go into a restaurant and 17 of them keep coming back, but two of them didn't like it, 
is the restaurant a good restaurant or a bad restaurant? Yeah, yeah it all depends on which side of the street, right? You'll focus on, on the two. I, I was going to ask you, so you can get it maybe in a little bit, because, you know, anything, particularly in the spy world, that seems to be successful, you would think, and, and you know, being, being sort of a CIA uh, watcher, I wonder whether or not they're still doing it in some capacity. But you, I, I was wondering if it was successful, why they would have gone away from it. Or was it just that, that old fashioned gumshoe spy, spying was more efficient? I, I, I don't know. Well, you know, that, you know, I think today spying is probably more efficient in some respects. Um, they get more satellites. They had at that time, yeah, at that time, the statistic on actionable intelligence was about 15% from traditional methods. So 15% is not great. Yeah. Uh, the statistic on remote viewing provided, the, the problem is that a lot of remote viewing didn't provide actionable intelligence. It provided intelligence, but can you act on it is a big question. Uh, depending on which government oversight person, uh, Ed published four volumes of the Stargate archives, which are material directly that has been declassified, some of which has been unredacted through a, a, an interesting process. And the successes, according to certain government officials, was actually higher than Ed thought. Ed thought there was 45% of actionable intelligence wow. that they had. This one government official put it at 85, and Ed, Ed has disputed that, even though he'd liked it to have been 85. Uh, but a lot of times they didn't hear back as to whether anybody acted on it. So they would get this request for information, and then they would be told just simply, oh, good job, guys. It's good information. But did anyone act on it? They don't know for some of the, some of the incidents. Yeah, I remember reading Joe McGonigal's book, and he sort of said, yeah. Some of the higher ups, you know, they were a little bit leery of going in and they would say, well, where'd you get this information? And, oh, well, some guy in a back room somewhere just drew it on a piece of paper. But, you know, you can't really go, right, to the, right. can't go to the president of the United States with that and tell him to bring in the, drop some bombs here. <laughs> so, but well, I think- A lot of times, yeah, a lot of times they had, a lot of times they, they had to have a second point of corroboration. Yeah, that, that's right. You know, I remember that. I, now I do remember that, that, that submarine story. And I think what, as I recall, what, what, it wasn't anywhere near the water, I think, was part of the issue, was it not? And they're like, what are you, crazy? There's no submarine. Yeah, it was pretty far away from, yeah, from, a, it, it was a channel that they had dug, but it was not like directly next to um, one of the one of the seas or big lakes or anything. Yeah. Well, I'd like to also talk, so that's a segue. And you said about 1995. Um, where, where would you see, and, and that almost, and I know it's not quite directly related to parapsychology, but that was probably almost almost a, a pinnacle, wasn't it? You had a government agency involved, you were doing, it was real, it was real intelligence work that was having, like you said, a pretty high, high efficiency rate, or in terms of actionable. Where, where has the, the field and all of that gone since then? I mean, where, maybe the program itself, and then parapsychology in general, that would be about sure. 20 years ago. Well, for one thing, one of the things that I think Target put up for smart doing and others that were involved in the program did, they didn't just do top secret research. So the tasks themselves were, were top secret, but they were also able to do remote viewing experiments that were published in parapsychology and other journals or talked about at the Parapsychological Association. They just couldn't talk about the specific, uh, that they were doing government research or that they were doing top secret research until the program ended. So uh, remote viewing has been repeatable, uh, has been replicated under enormous number of control conditions under various, by various people. Uh, it has been used to find archeological sites. It's, it's actually had real application in the world besides psychic spying as well. Mm -hmm. And there is quite a bit of that still going on, uh, that application of remote viewing in the corporate world and the science, you know, for some scientists, some oh, wow. researchers, for that side of things. Uh, even in the financial world, to some extent, trying to do a form of remote viewing that seems to be paying off somewhat in terms of doing investment. And that's been, uh, it's a separate from the kind of remote viewing I described before. Uh, there are also yeah, a lot of people who that, claim to have been. Excuse me, I, I just say there are also a lot of people. Who, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say there are a lot of people who are claiming to have been part of the program, successful part of the program, who may have been there but washed out pretty quickly didn't do very well, but they're trading on the fact that they were part of that program. And some of them charge, have their own methods of uh, teaching remote viewing, which is um, sometimes really expensive. Ed gets very upset with Ed May and, and I think Joe McMonagall also get really upset when they hear somebody charging $3,000 for a remote viewing course, when in fact, you can teach people that a lot faster than what they're talking about. 
and cheaper. Yeah, I actually went, I was actually at the Arthur Finley College for a week in uh, September 19, 2019. And we did some of that. And, and that was actually for me, the, the whole week, that was the most, I had never done it before. And I was actually able to, with a partner who was across from me, basically describe her entire apartment. I We went to this and it was, and she's like, that, actually her grandmother's apartment. I even had the sewing chest on there. I mean, it was pretty remarkable that we have these types of abilities within us. And, and you know, you, I wonder what would happen if we actually encouraged our, you know, our school children and other things to try to be more perceptive and more intuitive from the, from the, from the get-go. Maybe, maybe they wouldn't look at, maybe they wouldn't have to Google things so much. <laughs> they could just do it. They could just do it up in, in their mind. Um, yeah. We have about, we have about another about minute and a half or so, but I, we're going to get in more into your story in the second half, but can you just sort of in the remaining time in this segment, just tell us where you think parapsychology is today? Because I know the, the, so my sense is that the, the world or the culture is awakening more perceptually. And yet there's still, like we described this mainstream, you know, taboo on this topic. Where are we in 2021 with it? Well, um, in the United States, we have a problem with, with academia uh, because the skeptics organization was very, very successful and making it uncomfortable for people to even admit their interests in the scientific community in the subject. Um, we are trying to ally more with consciousness research because that's really what we're doing is research on consciousness. And that's somewhat successful. And there, there's more and more um, people who are at least looking at our research in our field or collaborating a little bit. It's just a really tough circumstance because there's only one funding foundation that provides information, any sort of uh, monies to support research. So it's a tough thing for parapsychologists or for parapsychology to expand at this point. Yeah, and I, again, I think that's the way in a lot of alternative sciences, unfortunately. Uh, but I do believe, again, the masses are going to be ahead of, the, ahead of the powers that may or shouldn't be or whatever you want to call it. And I think ultimately it's going to be a grassroots thing driving, driving people. Well, we can hope anyway. But when we get back... Uh, I want to get into your own personal journey and how you ended up uh, where you are and how, how this has become such an important part of your life. So uh, when we return, I'll be with my guest Lloyd Auerbach and we'll see you after the break. Hi, welcome back to Mind to Heart with your host, Craig Richardson, and my guest today, Lloyd Auerbach. Uh, Lloyd actually does a Facebook Live every other Sunday, and this, it'll be this Sunday at 8.30 Eastern time. It's facebook.com backslash the live paranormal. Uh, and he also suggests that if you want to get more information on him and, and, and this topic, go to rhine.org, which is the Rhine Education Center. And, and my website is craigerichardson.com. Lloyd, we, we discussed uh, your field and, and what you, you know, what paranormal and parapsychology is all about. But now I'd like to, as my show is all about journeys, I'd like to get into the journey of Lloyd Auerbach. And of course, you always got to start in the beginning. So I'd like to maybe hear a little bit about where you grew up and your family life and your influences and your heroes and things like that. Sure. Well, I grew up outside of New York City in Westchester County. Uh, my dad worked for NBC. So I had a TV set in my room when I was two, um, heavily influenced by television. Uh, my mother was a preschool teacher. She actually, I taught, she taught me to read um, when I was probably four. Uh, so, uh, and I started reading comic books, uh, more of the DC line, so Superman, Batman, that stuff. And uh, also loved Greek myths and Norse myths growing up uh, as a little kid and moved into science fiction and fantasy um, as I got into it. Uh, so um, I grew up in the, the, mainly in the 1960s. I had real interest in psychic powers because of certain and ghosts because of TV shows. Really, it was really television that pushed me in that direction. But also, comic books helped a lot. In fact, I think I, I saw the word parapsychology first in a comic book. Um, I knew I had a uh, much better vocabulary than my friends because I knew what the word invulnerable meant at age five. Uh, <laughs> Kryptonite. Thanks to Superman. <laughs> and um, it, in, my parents were always, you know, supportive of whatever we were, my, myself and my brothers were interested in. Um, my dad actually eventually moved into sports. He became a, a major producer and an exec at NBC. Uh, but my uncle also, his older brother was a soap opera director. Oh, neat. And my mother's brother was a, a radio newscaster at a major news station in New York. So I was like 
surrounded by media um, growing yep. up and really got a feel for got a, I got a feel for how television was made. I mean, I, I, there weren't a lot of reality shows back then, but I really understood how TV was made, what was real, what, what wasn't. But it was some of those fun shows. It was actually Dark Shadows and Star Trek that sent me to the library mm -hmm. looking for books on everything from vampires, because that was Dark Shadows, to parapsychology right, right. and psychic abilities and ESP. And I found books by J.B. Ryan and J.G. Pratt and other scientists. Um, I was a little science geek. One of the first things my dad did when I was a kid that, that impressed the hell out of me as a child was he worked on this, the news coverage of the Mercury and Gemini space shots. Oh, that's cool. So I was always watching those growing up. I was really interested in space travel and astronomy and such and geology. So I was a science nerdy kid, but now <laughs> I'm looking at this other stuff. And I was so, so happy to find that there was real science to studying psychic abilities. That led me to start a parapsychology club in my high school. Oh, really? Uh, in Elmsford, New York. Yeah, I had um, a couple of teachers, one of whom was a physics teacher who was fr originally from India, was very interested in the subject, had had his own out of body experiences and other experiences mm -hmm. as well. And so um, he and the Earth, it was really interesting, he and the Earth science teacher <laughs> were the ones who sponsored our, cl our club. So it really, again, was a, a heavy influence of science in there. Um, the universe kind of pushed me in this direction. One of my neighbors, um, the mother of one of my one of my brother's friends, was actually a yoga teacher, and one of her students was Montague Ullman, who did the dream telepathy studies at Maimonides Hospital, who lived oh, about wow. a mile and a half from us. Oh, sure. So yeah, I got introduced I, I, to him. I, I got introduced to him. He introduced me to Gertrude Schmeidler, another parapsychologist who lived in the area. So this is all when I'm a teenager, mind you. I got to meet Hans Holter, the famous ghost hunter, because he was working in the same building as my uncle, the radio announcer, uh, newscaster. So um, I had intended in, in high school, because I was so enmeshed in reading this science, that somehow I was going to study this as a, uh, when I got out. Um, I actually got a letter back from J.B. Ryan when I asked, what do I do? Because there's no parapsychology programs. And his advice was to study any science and then in grad school, try to try to work through some part of your thesis on on parapsychology. And I lucked out because um, even though I started in astronomy at Northwestern, I switched uh, under J. Allen Hynek, the UFO researcher. Um, uh, I switched over to anthropology and was very lucky to find that my advisor, um, who was assigned to me in anthro department, actually had the journal parapsychology on his shelves in his office. So, so timing wise, a lot of the doors open telling me it. something. My senior year, yeah. And then I then it turned out the JFK University on the West Coast was starting its program in 1977. So I found that out at my senior year in college and uh, took a year off between college and grad school and then ended up in the grad program in parapsychology. And that, and that was actually in California. That's brought that's what got you out to the West Coast. That's what brought up me out to the West Coast. I actually moved back to the East Coast after graduating. Um, I kind of missed food and pizza and family um, <laughs> and deli. I miss really good deli. Uh, so yeah, yeah, New York has back this. to New York, uh, I had some ideas for the American Society for Psychical Research for Outreach and went in to talk to somebody in the education department about it. They sent me upstairs to their brand new executive director. I uh, started telling him my ideas and he offered me a job on the spot. I didn't even know I was <laughs> applying for a job. I wasn't applying for it, but I got a job. So I worked there for about a year and a half, and then uh, JFK's uh, got a university on the West Coast got a, a grant to bring someone in to do outreach to the media and to the public. And so they brought me back out for that and also to teach in the graduate program. Uh, I was very happy to come back to California because two more winters in New York and I just was tired. Yeah, so, that, that'll that'll do it. But it just sounds like, you know, even, you know, I guess Carl Jung would call these synchronicities, but, you know, they, they get a grant and describing if you, as you described your background and then the, the job description, I, I, you know, guy who grows up in media, his dad's in the, in the business, his yeah. uncles, I mean, sounds to me, you know, and you're into parapsychology since you were a kid, I it's almost sounds like they wrote the job description for you. Pretty much, yeah. It was, it was a very weird thing. And then um, in 1984, when Ghostbusters came out, we still had our we had our graduate parapsychology program, and we were the only ones in the country. So we got a little bit of attention when Ghostbusters first started, you know. And then it, unlike movies today, Ghostbusters stayed in the theater for well over three months. Anyway. Uh, you know, back then movies could do that <clears throat> if they were doing well. 
And I, uh, we got a call to the department um, from the Oakland Tribune and they wanted to do a major story on our faculty on, on the only parapsychology, the real life Ghostbusters. I, uh, the time she wanted to do it though, I was the only one in town. Everybody else could afford to go to the Parapsychological Association convention in Dallas. I couldn't. So the story ended up being all about me. It was a two page spread wow. um, as a real life Ghostbuster. It got picked up by the Associated Press, it actually led to my first book being purchased and, and, uh, and written. Well, again, I, you know, these, these doors just seem to, you know, seem to just be opening for you. I mean, it, yeah. And it sounds too like you have a personality where you were, you were accepting of it. I mean, you were scientific oriented, but you were also new enough. I think it probably about, you know, about psychic issue or uh, activities and just sort of, some people would have questioned it maybe in saying, but you just sound like you just sort of went with it. Yeah, I just went with the flow and I, you know, I, working at the ASPR in New York, um, we had research going on in out-of-body experience and Alex Tanis was a phenomenal psychic who was the subject of that research. And I spent a lot of time with Alex, actually. Uh, I've got some great advice from him and Dr. Osis, who was the researcher mentor, you know, was, he was kind of a mentor to me for investigations. So I really was exposed to psychics and, and other things, even though I hadn't had my own experiences at that point, uh, pretty early on in my career. And have you had psychic experiences? I mean, are you, you able to receive messages or do you, you know, do you, do you practice that? I mean, any of that? I teach it. I don't practice it. <laughs> you know, those, I, I really <laughs> don't. Um, I haven't put a lot of emphasis on doing that myself. Although I try to let myself really be open when I'm performing as a magician slash really performing mentalist as a mentalist. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, you too about that. So that's a good segue. Can you can you talk a little bit because that's really cool. I mean, I've seen so you, I think yeah. you, in our in our course you showed some some sessions you did and it was or some magic shows you did. It was really cool. So one of the courses we actually had in our graduate studies was uh, called the Creation of Illusions, and it was about psychic fraud. It was taught by a local magician, and our um, department chair John Palmer felt it was important for researchers to understand something about magic and what its possibilities are and the psychology of it. And I was bartending my way through grad school at the time. So I immediately started doing magic at the bar. And making some <laughs> a better money. place to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, ended up getting, um, joining uh, the Society of American Magicians. And I started, I started performing. I, I love performing. I'd done a little comedy in college. So I was doing comedy magic. Um, eventually, Marcello Tutsi, who I mentioned earlier in this hour, my mentor said, you need to switch to mentalism. You need to be a little more serious. Stop doing the comedy clubs. <laughs> And so um, <laughs> I ended up, uh, I did end up consulting with various researchers because I was a performing magician and I spent a lot of time learning stuff as well in the eighties. And then I switched to mentalism around 1989, thanks to Marcello, I eventually joined the Psychic Entertainers Association, which is an international organization. And I was president of that organization actually for a few years, uh, starting in 2001. So I, I've kind of been, I've had my foot in both worlds very deeply. Um, I'd be performing now, if, if not for the pandemic. So it's funny waiting you're for talking, this all to be over. As you were talking, I saw the card, the magician card, and that seems to be uh, apropos for you uh, with a yellow background and all. Um, well, we, we, we're we going to segue into our, our, our final break here. Um, when we get back, I want to I want to get into a little bit because my show is also about spiritual journeys. And, and you know, as you said, you teach it. Um, which so you've you've probably and you've probably you know certainly you've been around it so you've probably seen how you know opening yourself up to these to even the possibilities of these things can can help people yeah. along the way in in their journey so I, I want to finish our last segment talking you know more about how this you know a how this can impact people's spirituals and b if people have heard this or or, or they've had questions or maybe they've seen Ghostbusters you know, what, what, what they might do uh, in order to, to get more out of this. So we'll, we'll get into that in my last uh, segment with my guest, Lloyd Auerbach, and we'll see you after the break. Hi, welcome back to Mind to Heart with your host, Craig Richardson. I can be found at craigerichardson.com, and I'm delighted to have my guest, Lloyd Auerbach, uh, here for the our last segment. Again, he runs a uh, Facebook Live every other Sunday. It'll be this Sunday, which is facebook.com backslash the live paranormal. Uh, he also suggests that if you want to get more information on parapsychology and what we've talked about this segment this hour, 
you can go to the Rhine, uh, Rhine.org, and that's R H I N E. Um, Lloyd, as I said before the break, um, you know, so many people on my show is all dedicated to spiritual journeys. And I've had my own where, you know, I came out of the Catholic world not that not that long ago. And, and, I, and there is actually a lot of this in that in that world. Um, there are a lot of orders and, you know, the world people have, there's actually, it's in the Bible, you know, where um, King Saul, who had banned psychics, actually went to one to figure out who this young upstart king, who ultimately became King David was. Um, and, I'm, and I'm convinced that the Vatican has using, been using psychics forever, but um, what, what do you see, you know, and I know you said you're an educator, which you are, um, wh how do you see what we've talked about uh, today impacting people spiritually as, they, as we get into this time of awakening? Well, for one thing, one of the, one of the main implications of psychic ability um, is interconnectedness, that we are, our consciousness, our spirit, our soul, whatever you want to call it, is connected directly to the environment, not just our physical bodies. There's much more to us than mainstream and other sciences are telling us. Uh, we have, I can't say limitless possibilities, but we have the ability to kind of reach out beyond our normal immediate zone, you might say. Uh, the other piece that parapsychology studies, because we do study the idea of consciousness surviving the death of the body, are the implications for afterlife or life after death. Um, I work with a foundation called the Forever Family Foundation. I'm president of that organization, nonprofit that supports the work of spirit mediums and scientific research, looking at mediumship and other, other evidence for life after death. And from a spiritual perspective, that's what that's all about. I mean, you, you don't have to take it from a spiritual perspective. You can take it from a purely intellectual perspective, but these experiences have a true emotional impact on us as well especially if we know, if we absorb the idea that this is connecting us to the world. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing for everybody because you can be overwhelmed. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things that we have to teach people is how to make sure they can shut themselves down too because you don't wanna to be too open. Uh, you don't wanna be getting information bombarding you from all directions beyond while well, the information is already bombarding us in real life. Yeah, right. So, um, there are ways to actually do that. So it's a process to learn how to open up. Uh, you were mentioning kids earlier, you know, kids are more psychic, but then we shut them down. The mm. education system shuts them down. Science shuts them down. Uh, religion shuts them down. Sure. Kids would be more open, you know, connected to things if they were able to explore the experiences that they are already having. So it's, it's something that it's, it's gonna require a major shift in society to be able to accept this. And then you have people who are very afraid of these abilities. You know, I've had skeptics, the, the disbelievers say, you know, they don't want even want to believe that this is possible yeah. because if, you know, if suddenly the world could do ESP, then their deepest, darkest secrets would be gone, you know? <laughs> and and I, I always have to point out to them that it's not a switch to turn. It's not gonna like happen overnight. Mm. And we also know how people can block this stuff. I mean, it's not that hard to do that. So I said, your secrets are safe, although I'm sure that you probably do want to keep them hidden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, and I think, you know, when you get into that rote mode viewing, people are like, oh my gosh, you know, what are they, what are they going to see? But, you know, it's interesting too, and I grew up a little bit later than you, but not much. I, you know, I was more in the late 60s, early 70s. And I remember you talk about the children and the play. And as you were talking, I was thinking of, you know, I was a big Winnie the Pooh fan. And I just remember reading those books and, and it, and it it really was like you could put yourself into the scenes back then. And you, yeah. and I think you, as a kid, you really fit, felt you were in that, you know, with me, it was the pool corner and I knew those. And I, and I, and I think we lost, we've lost a lot. And some of it's because, you know, Hollywood got fairly commercialized and, and I love, I love what they do, but in some ways they almost said, here is what you should do. And opposed to allowing kids to have free thought and free, you know, free play. And I, I think that's an important point. One other thing about kids, I want to go, and I should have brought it up earlier. So, isn't not another area of parapsychology where they interview the two to three year olds who may have had a past life experiences? Yeah, so one of the areas within the research on survival of bodily death uh, is reincarnation the, or the idea of reincarnation. And the University of Virginia has kind of pioneered the process and done most of the work interviewing kids of between two and four years old who talk about a past life, who remember spontaneously. This is not hypnosis, this is not with adults. 
these are kids who sometimes, not always, but sometimes have incredibly factual information that can be verified, tracked down, even if they have the family has no connection to those people from that past life. Um, there are thousands of these cases on record. There's a percentage of them have that are solvable cases where they have that direct detail. There's a smaller percentage of those solvable cases where the kid has a birthmark that resembles the mode of death of that previous person, which was typically an accident or murder or something traumatic. And you know, for us in the field, uh, it's a really interesting thing because let's just say there's no reincarnation. What in the world is that? And the very fact that science refuses to look at those cases, forget about the reincarnation piece, but they don't even look at those cases because they're biased against anything that smacks of spirituality or, or possibility that there's something more here. And that's a, that's a real unscientific attitude. That's just not an approach that's correct. Yeah, and I think it's also really damaging to the, to the masses because in fact, if we are body, spirit and soul, you know, they're sort of saying that this this third piece, which in my opinion is the most important, doesn't exist. And then, and then, as you said, they, you know, we've been quote trying to figure out whether or not reincarnation exists, and there's some pretty strong evidence that it doesn't. And like you said, it's scientifically based. Yeah, I, I think I mean, that that would have that has huge ramifications for for everything. Yeah, in science, unfortunately, there you know, there most of Western scientists are from a materialist standpoint, and that particular philosophy, you look at the evidence and you're not going to look at the possibility that it's reincarnation. You're not gonna look at the possibility that survival because that's not what your philosophy says. And what needs to happen is people mm. need to be more open to other possibilities. I mean, we just had a particle confirmed. It was the second time it had been seen that seems to violate the laws of physics. The first time was in the early 2000s. And you know, there, there's a huge uproar about this, but if it's gonna change the laws of physics at the quantum level, it doesn't affect the macro level the way we think of it. But there's a lot we still don't know. And to not study these experiences, regardless of whether it's a ghost, reincarnation, ESP or whatever else, not studying them is highly unscientific and does a disservice to us as human beings. Yeah, and like I said earlier, I think unfortunately there's a lot of that across a lot of, a lot of, a lot of disciplines and, you know, I, I just think, and, and as I said also earlier, I, I think that, the, the, you know, I'm a case in point too. I never would have gotten to this and then I did get in and you had your own way. You came in through a scientific and an interest in, uh, you know, in, in some of the comic books and stuff. But I, I just think that it's, going. It, and you mentioned consciousness. And I think that might be the middle ground where yeah. people settle because, I, you know, we, and now the Eastern philosophy is coming in and you mentioned that you, some of your mentors have been from, from the Eastern philosophy and I think we're just in a much bigger soup now. It's not just Western anymore. And I think that's a healthy thing. Yeah, I think it's also very healthy that even though we don't have an agreement of what consciousness is or where it resides or what created it, um, there is enough interest in a variety of sciences across the board of studying this idea of consciousness on its own, whether it's in the brain or not. Uh, I think that's the direction that our field is also looking towards that direction because what we're presenting are experiences or phenomena of direct consciousness. You know, ESP is connecting directly with the world around you. And one of the Im implications of our field, which is scary to people, is that we may not be as much individuals as we, as we think. We are actually influencing the world in more ways than we think, and we're connected to people in more ways than we'd like. Yeah, and, and ultimately, is it not that, you know, there's a very strong spiritual and, and philosophical thing that says we're all connected. We are all okay. one. We are all, and, and this isn't, this isn't necessarily out there. This is true. It's we are all energy and we're all interconnected. And I think that's what consciousness helps show. And I think it's helpful to, <clears throat> excuse me, spiritually, because, you know, there's a lot of lonely people out there, right? And if, and if they suddenly realize that, that we aren't alone, that we're not sort of our own, having a body experience all out of, out of context, I think that's a healthy thing, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I would agree. I would definitely agree. We're all part of the well, force. Yeah, <laughs> let the force be with, excuse me, let the force be with you. Uh, anyway, we, we have about another minute or so, um, and, and I wanted to just kind of give you an opportunity before I, I close out here to, to leave us with any parting thoughts. I really appreciate you taking the time today. It's been a very, very uh, interesting and, and educational experience, but what, 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 do you, what great pearls of wisdom do you have for, for those? I, I think um, stop paying attention to the paranormal TV shows because they're not, not what anybody really does. Um, and really look into uh, good sources of parapsychological work. 
you know, start with the Rhine Center, rhine.org. We're actually starting our next courses in a couple of weeks. And I am teaching a course on the evidence for life after death. Awesome. So that's going to start on, on May 6th. So if you go to rhine.org and click on the education link, you'll see that. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Prof Paranormal or at Lloyd Auerbeck, either one. Uh, but I'll mention that if you're really interested in different aspects, the Rhine Center is a great place to start. There are links out to other organizations. And uh, I'm always happy to answer questions for people. If they want to just send a, a note to an email to profparanormal at gmail.com, as in professor. So profparanormal at gmail.com. Well, Lloyd, it was great to see you uh, again. I really appreciate you taking this time. And, 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 and it's been a wonderful show. And, and for my listeners, I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for listening to Mind to Heart with me, Craig Richardson. My path has led me from the Protestant and Catholic churches, as well as studies in alchemy, mediumship, Eastern philosophy, and most recently, Edgar Cayce and transpersonal psychology. As an intuitive life coach, I am ready to guide you to an amazing life. For more information about me, visit craigerichardson.com.